In tonight's reading, St. Paul finally speaks a comforting word. Welcome back to St. Paul Lutheran Church in Unionville, Michigan, on this Friday, the 16th of June, in the year of our Lord, 2023. I'm glad you can join us as we, uh, as we end our day and our week with God's Word and prayer. And as we do, uh, this is now week 24, day 5, of reading through the New Testament in 2023. And that brings us to Romans chapter 3. So, again, we are through the narrative books of the Old Testament, or the New Testament, excuse me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, which tell the story of Jesus' life and ministry, which tell the story of the early church. Uh, now, the book of Romans, here Paul is laying out uh, in this letter to the church in Rome, uh, Paul is laying out what we believe as God's people. And he started, as he started, as we've heard the last couple of days, by addressing uh, the pride that the Jews of his day had in the fact that they were God's people by birth, uh, that they were circumcised, that they lived according to the laws of Moses. Um, they had the perception, I, 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 I don't think there's a better way, at least I don't have a better way of describing it, other than saying they felt like because of those things, God owed them something. Because of their own righteousness, or what was really self-righteousness. And so Paul has been just dismantling that idea in the last couple of chapters, showing that not only the circumstances in our world, uh, but also our own experiences show how guilty we are before God. Because no matter how much we might take pride in in one area, there is always another area in which we are absolutely guilty. And, uh, and that is where we are left before God. The law always accuses. Uh, so now here he wraps up that thought and thankfully points us to the joy of the gospel. So let's turn to our text. Romans chapter 3. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some of them were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the, faithful, the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us, charge us with saying? Your condemnation is just. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. 
Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Thus far Romans chapter 3. So, there is a bunch in there that we could unpack, but I think the best summary is the point that I've made a couple times over the past week or week and a half. And that is the point that Luther's saying, uh, what, what is it about your works that think that you could please God any more than, and your works could please God more than the perfect life, the perfect death, and the perfect resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again, that condemns us by completely destroying any pretense of our own righteousness before God. And, at the same time, it assures you of something far greater than you could have ever hoped to have earned from God on your own. Let's, yeah, let me, I'm trying to decide which way to go. So you, you recall the, the parable of the workers where the, the owner of a vineyard goes out early in the day and hires workers, and then he goes out in the you know, the, the sixth hour and, and hires some more and goes out in the ninth hour and works uh, and hires some more and goes out in the eleventh hour and hires some more and at the end of the day all of them those who were hired at the end of the day and those who were hired at the beginning of the day they're all given the same pay what we miss there is that final application of that parable, which is to say that there is only one who has labored faithfully from the very beginning of the day, and that is Jesus Christ. And his wages 
the full wages of one who has labored from the very beginning of the day, his wages are now paid out to you. Far more than anything you could have hoped to earn for yourself, far more than you could have ever deserved, than you could have ever imagined. That is now yours by faith, and he does not begrudge you even one little bit, one penny of those wages. Because that's why he did it. He earned all of that so that he could give it to you as a gift. All right, I think that's where we've got to stop. Bottom line, Paul's message has been devastating, leaving no excuse, leaving no shelter under which we could hide and still pretend to have any righteousness of our own before God. But he did it so that he could then offer you something far, far greater. And that is God's gift to you in Jesus Christ. Let's close with Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. As always, thank you for joining us as we end our day and our week with God's Word and Prayer. God willing, we will see you on Sunday, either here in person or on this live stream for church and for Bible study. Uh, in the meantime, God's blessings on your night and on your weekend.